start. Start. Good evening and happy <coughs> Labor Day, happy May Day, happy Workers' Day. And welcome to all of our viewers, as well as those joining us via our Facebook live stream. I am Juan Edgel Jr., your host. Tonight's edition of This Week in 60 Minutes will look at some of the major issues dominating the new cycle. We will look at facts, fictions, and the APNU AFC coalition government. We know that in the last four years, the APNU AFC coalition has in a very barefaced manner peddled dozens of fallacious claims in an effort to claim achievements in office. So one. Yeah, I have with me uh, this <coughs> evening a, a document which highlights some of the fictions that this government has been boasting that they would have uh, attained or the promises that they would have kept to the, to the Guyanese public. But I also have with me the facts to prove that this is not necessarily so. So the fiction is that four budgets uh, were passed in three years. But the fact is all four budgets introduced policies that negatively impacted the working class, Guyanese and the productive sectors. Over 200 new taxes and fees were introduced. Others were introduced astronomically. Another fiction is that training opportunities for Gaisuku workers were provided. The fact is that no substantive support has been given to the 7,000 plus sugar workers who were fired by this APNU plus AFC coalition government. Government's unwillingness to support the sack sugar workers has been evidence in the fact that the government broke the law, did not pay the workers their full severance. And another fiction is that they created 5,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is, since May 2015, 30,000 Guyanese have lost their jobs. Government's claim of creating over 5,000 jobs has been challenged. To date, the AP and UAFC coalition government has not responded and has not said where these 5,000 jobs were created or which sector it was created in. Definitely one. Um, to expound on what Wana was saying there, we have uh, some other fictions which, were, which are being peddled by the coalition government. For example, they say that new guy in elections, chairman appointed. We all know the history of that. We have um, our guest tonight will expound more on this point. But just to give you the fact of the matter is that the 85-year-old GCOM chairman was unilaterally and unconstitutionally appointed by the president in breach of 25 years of practice and common understanding by the government and the opposition. Yes. Um, also, we have um, the government saying that major criminal gang smashed, members prosecuted. Now, all Guyanese know the reality out there. Every day you wake up, you see someone being robbed, someone being killed. Yes. Just Which last night, yes, yeah, just last night, situation. actually, um, yes. we woke up to the news that a Parika businessman has been killed in his yes, home, robbed and killed. So the fact is, there has been no such report from the Guyana police force or from anywhere, as a matter of fact, to support these claims or substantiate these claims by the government that um, you know crime is down or that. Um, major criminal gangs have been smashed and people are being prosecuted. So what Guyanese have seen over the past four years is a pattern of claims, uh, claims of success when the reality is vastly different. So this vastly different reality is clearly evident when we look at the labor issues uh, in Guyana, the unemployment levels and the failure to create jobs, as well as the struggle public servants have had to secure pay increases. And we saw this year with the country wide protests by public school teachers. We saw yes. the, the demonstrations that they had. Definitely. So Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow is actually one of the, the champions of trade unionism in Guyana and, and widely across the entire Caribbean. Uh, he has been known to have started the first union and uh, he would have made a lot of strides to ensure that workers uh, would have received pay increases and they had proper working conditions. So it is our responsibility actually to make sure that his work was not in vain and those of our foreparents to mm -hmm. ensure that everything that they struggled for, mm -hmm. that we continue to build on that and that it's not, it is not destroyed by, by any government, by any unit. So Guyanese, we must, we have responsibility as Guyanese, I should say, not to allow regression to occur, but for us to make progress uh, in every way. Oh, well, on that note, um, one, we yes. have seen the People's Progressive Party Labor Day message yes, um, where they pointed out, and I quote, many of the gains won by these workers are now being threatened and much of the progress made are being reversed under the APNU yes. AFC coalition. 
Uh, just to read a, a bit more from the PPP statement, yes. they said, yeah, let's, let's hear it. We in the PPP are aware that the economic and political situation in our country is a matter of deep concern and worry to workers and their families. Workers from every sector and people from all walks of life are apprehensive not only about their daily existence, yes. but more importantly about their future, their children's future, and the future of our country. We believe that these fears and apprehensions are well-founded. Every productive sector is on the decline. In the sugar industry, estates have been closed and thousands of workers, I repeat, thousands of workers were dismissed. In the mining sector, small and medium scale miners are being taxed out of existence, which together with several other factors have skyrocketed the cost of production, thereby for forcing them out of existence. In the rice sector, have suffered tremendous decline owing to the absence of new markets, lack of competitive prices for paddy, and many other factors. The forestry sector have also suffered a deep decline. In the commercial sector, there is a drastic decline in trade and commerce. So most <coughs> Guyanese, as we would know, are affected by, or in one way or another, by the current state of affairs in this country. And mm -hmm. when you target the working class of any, of any particular country, you're actually targeting the heart of that country because those are the people who, who work and those are the people who develop the country in, every, in one way or another. So uh, the platitudes of this government and the things that they say, I saw in the address, the President's uh, Labor Day address, and, and just to quote, uh, he said, workers today are much better off. Uh, on quote, he also said, quote, your government remains a friend of workers, on quote. So uh, could we really relate to this message that they're, they're putting out there? I, I think that on one hand, they're, they're putting out this, this line that, you know, they're champion, championing, championing the, the, the efforts of the workers mm -hmm. or they're trying to, you know, put forward the best hand or a helping hand to the workers, but we're seeing their actions is not in line with what they're seeing to, mm -hmm. to, the, to the Guyanese people. Yeah. So we really have to wonder, because Guyanese deserve much more than they have received over the past four years, more than the incompetence that has been demonstrated by this government. Uh, definitely one. We saw that this level of incompetence have made its way into the National Assembly, the highest decision-making body in Guyana. Um, last Friday, where uh, the government who attended the sitting, 33 members, yes. the PP was not there, yeah, the 32 members from the People's Progressive Party or the parliamentary opposition, yes. they were not there. We saw they took an insensitive, ill-conceived and controversial motion to honor a convicted terrorist by the name of Abdul Qadir. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the 32 um, opposition parliamentarians were not there in parliament, and I believe so firmly that even if they were in parliament, they would have been against this motion. In fact, there was a statement from yes. the PPP to condemn yes, this yes. said motion. Uh, uh, just let me read a bit of that, of that, uh, sure. of that statement. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it says, uh, the use of the National Assembly, Guyana's highest decision-making body, to honor the People's National Congress former member of parliament who was convicted in the United States for plotting to blow up the John F. Kennedy International Air Airport is another act of betrayal of democracy and the rule of law, <coughs> as it is clearly not reflective of the will of the people of Guyana. Guyanese are known as peaceful, law-abiding citizens at home and, of course, those abroad. Uh, the use of the parliamentary of a parliamentary resolution is now an indeli indelible stain on our people and national character that will not easily be for forgiven or forgotten by those who have suffered at the hands of international terrorism. What was interesting was the expression of regret by the government after the fact that, that they would have, uh, the statement would have come out and several others would have also condemned what they, what they would have said. Definitely. One of those was the statement from the United States Embassy, yeah. which, um, and I'd like to read a part of it at the yeah, very sure, ending, the sure. United States um, Embassy here in Georgetown said that, with this resolution honoring a convicted terrorist, members of the Guyana's National Assembly has left a stain on their legacy as representatives of the Guyanese people and on their commitment to the rule of law. Now, yeah. we saw that um, Valerie Patterson Yearwood, the former Minister of Housing, yes. um, brought this motion to the Parliament. And she 
when she was questioned by the media, she said that she was instructed yes, that, that was to that bring the motion, yeah. that um, she's just following instructions. Instructions from, the, from her chief whip. From her chief whip, whip definitely, uh, yeah. So um, when Ms. Amna Ali was also questioned, she didn't, yeah. interestingly enough, she didn't say that, you know, the government, um, we regret what we did or yeah. anything. They seem to justify it by yeah. saying that, oh, it's not the first time we have done this. But they seem to miss the major point and said, yes. and they subsequently said that, oh, um, the United States have misinterpreted what they intended what they to do. Saying. But yeah. all of Ghana has been condemning them, especially on the social media, and there have been several public statements yes. from the United um, the United States Embassy, yeah, the, the European the, Union, exactly, the European as well Union. as the, the British High Commissioner had also, uh, he had also made a comment on this issue. I yes. think he had made it, uh, he had, uh, sent out a tweet on it, and yes. I think he had also made a, f a following uh, statement on the issue. Yes, he also uh, was one of those who were condemning yeah. it. But, but Rudy, uh, <coughs> if you really want to honor uh, somebody like this, who may be, it may be controversial to do so, mm -hmm. I think they could have possibly went to Congress place and, uh, and done the ordering of Abdul Qadir, but to take, uh, to take our National Assembly, mm -hmm. you know, we have our representatives there. That is yeah. like you're, you're speaking on behalf of Guyanese people. Exactly, you know, definitely. They, they could have taken uh, the celebration mm -hmm. or the honoring of, of this gentleman, or Abdul Qadir, whatever his name is, mm -hmm. to, towards Congress Place. That is uh, why I mentioned... And not, uh, to, not to the National Assembly. Definitely. That is why I mentioned that it was insensitive, ill-conceived, yes. and controversial. And it seems that the government has no remorse as, you know, their usual style and character. So we move on to our next topic that we'd like to discuss tonight, yeah. um, the shake-up with the ministers. We know this is something that's been happening over and yes. over within the Granger-led coalition government. So we have seen um, late last week the government announced a shake-up with the ministers. Um, so what, what exactly did they do? Yeah, what did so we, see? we saw a new position created for the um, dual citizen MP yes. who had to resign, Mr. Joseph Harmon. Yeah. He is now the, the director general, general of the Ministry of the Presidency. Just let me, just let me uh, make a point on that, though, uh, Rudy. Mm -hmm. um, having now a director general of the Ministry of the Presidency, you have a permanent secretary mm -hmm. at the Ministry of the Presidency, and you still have a minister of state at the Ministry of the Presidency. Mm -hmm. So. Once again, what are the terms of reference for this for this new position? And is he going to be doing his same uh, the same task? Is he going to be doing other uh, other tasks? I mean, it just seems to be an overlapping of, of responsibilities. And, and uh, I, I do can Guyanese really afford? Can taxpayers afford to really be funding and, exactly. and paying all of these salaries? I mean, we have to get value for money. As is the common parlance so out yes. here, is just job for the boys. We're just <laughs> finding job for the boys as the yeah. country drift yeah. along. Um, we have seen also the embattled minister, Valerie Patterson Yearwood, which I just mentioned, who brought that Abdul Qadir motion into the National yeah. Assembly. She has now been moved to the Ministry of Agriculture yeah. after she was fingered in yeah. the contra in yeah. controversies where her own ministry was yeah. awarding contracts to and her and husband. She has responsibility now for rural affairs. Yes, that, she is now true. the minister yeah. um, as, uh, within the Ministry yeah. of Agriculture uh, responsible for rural, rural affairs. affairs. So. Yeah one wants to know what exactly is um, Noel Holder yeah. in charge of yes. in the ministry. It's urban affairs. Or <laughs> Definitely. Urban, exactly. um, another shake-up was the controversial natural resources minister was moved to the ministry of the presidency yes. with um, she is now responsible for youth affairs within yeah. that ministry and it's important to point out here one that this is probably the third or fourth time that this minister has been moved around wow. if memory serves correctly she was in um the ministry of social cohesion, cohesion. then she yeah, was she moved was there. to I social, think social protection she yeah, was in social, yeah, social protection. protection social protection and then she got uh, transferred yeah. at a later date from that from that ministry but yeah, uh, no. uh, mm -hmm. another point to note on this this issue of uh, creating positions and all the rest of it is that now you have about three persons now responsible for youth affairs. Um, there is the director of youth. There is the minister of social cohesion, with responsible for, for with partially responsible for youth. And now there is a minist minister within the ministry of the presidency with responsibility for youth affairs. We also but, have um, yeah. Christopher Jones, who is responsible for youth, the national youth director. As well. Okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but I think he's more or less with sport. Yeah, but sport yes, and youth. So. Yes, sport and youth. Yeah. But so I have to ask the question: uh, What exactly 
who exactly is promoting the interests of young people out there? Who is ensuring that their, their needs are being addressed? Uh, we have all of these, uh, these senior people having responsibilities with the titles, with the portfolios uh, that are having activities, but are young people really seeing their lives improve? Are their needs being addressed? Although we have these persons in the positions and as we know, being all being put within the ministry of the presidency, you know, what exactly is being done? I would say, or who is really benefiting from all of these uh, these exchanges and so on and so forth. Well, what we could say about the reshuffle is that it represents change around the same persons who are very likely to continue the same objectionable behavior. It's just in a new area, as you mentioned, yes. they're being pushed over to the uh, Ministry yeah. of the Presidency. Yeah. So these persons are not being reprimanded in any way or manner or disciplined in any way or manner. They're just being shifted from ministry to ministry and they continue with the same attitude, same yes. thing. And as a result, we, the people of Guyana, are the ones that are really suffering because we're not getting proper representation from our ministers. Yes, well, another, uh, on the question of, uh, or on the note of, of objectionable uh, behavior, we have also seen the latest developments uh, with the conflict of interest scandal, which is involving Minister Cathy Hughes and her company, Video Mega Productions. It's still, mm -hmm. if this issue is still out there, it has not been addressed as, as yet, yeah. Rudy. Yeah. Do you have a point to make, make on that? Um, yes, as you said, um, on the contrary, the claims by the Minister of Information disclosed uh, that several contracts were ordered by her own ministry to her company, Video Mega Productions. Um, in Hughes's own ministry, the Ministry of Public Telecommunication, yeah. Three contracts were awarded to Vi Video Mega Productions, which is the company owned by her. Um, uh, on June 4, 2018, yeah. the ministry awarded $939,738 for advertisement of vacancies for this ministry. So this is her own ministry then? Yes, own awarding, ministry. Awarding her company? Yes. So we're continuing the same ministry again, her own ministry, on, the, on 25th of June 2018, um, they awarded $119,670 for Facebook management hmm. to her company. Wow. Further, uh, 24th of September 2018, the company was awarded $2,291,128 for the CTU ITC Roadshow, which was held in 2018. Uh, Video Mega Production also benefited from other ministries, yes. uh, in particular five contracts from other ministries. So the Ministry of Public Infrastructure in September 19, 2018 yes. awarded a contract for $256,500 um, for television advertisement. Uh, interestingly, I said awarded. I meant to say that they have been paying these uh, yeah, sums of money. Yes. They, so, so and they're not no, contracts. No, no contract awarded, has yeah. been awarded yet to the, uh, yeah. um, to the ministry. The Ministry of Business on the 28th of September 2018 paid to Video Medical Productions 198,800 Ghana dollars for video for the Caribbean Tourism Diaspora Forum. Mm -hmm. The Ministry of Education in July 12, 2018 paid $1,487,700 for video productions. Ministry of Natural Resources on the 25th of May 2018 paid $1,420,115 for artwork. Artwork. from video mega production. I'm sure if the ministry would have engaged the Borough School of Arts, there are many students there that would have happily done the work and uh, I dare say a more professional manner for less, far less. Moving on, the Ministry of Public Health on the 27th of July 2018 paid to Video Mega Production $3,592,236 for advertisements yeah. within that ministry. Yeah. So just, just on a point to note is that uh, these monies are being paid but no award is being, is being given to, mm -hmm. to any company. So basically yeah. it, it would appear as though procurement laws and procurement practices are not being employed by uh, by Minister Cathy Hughes or by, by these different ministries that have been paying. Uh, because now that we have the law in place, you know, you're supposed to be having competitive bidding mm -hmm. in order so that uh, you get value for your money once again. 
and we see that there is no transparency. If one were to look at the ministries involved yes. as well, you see that the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, uh, the Ministry of Public Health, the Ministry of Natural Resources, these are all big ministries that have yes. been pointed out um, in questionable behavior indeed, in the f indeed, in the past. Indeed, um, indeed. We know from the PVC report what the Ministry of yes, Public Infrastructure yes. has been involved in with yes. the Demerara Harbour Bridge, the um, this whole sourcing of drugs. From the, mini the Ministry of mm -hmm. Health. Excellent point there, really. Yeah. It's good to know. Uh, yes, those revelations showed that uh, the video mega production company cashed in on over 10.3 million in 2018 alone. Uh, Guyanese remember that Minister Hughes on April 15, 2019 said, and I'll quote, I have taken no decision in my capacity as Minister of Public Telecommunications or in my personal capacity, which has been the subject of a conflict of interest, unquote. Yet more details, as we can see, are continuing to surface and expose her comments as somewhat disingenuous. Definitely. So Yes. So our second part of this program today will deal with um, the CCJ and the no confidence cases. As most Guyanese would know, the, um, the cases before the um, Caribbean, Court, the Caribbean of Court of Justice will yes. be up for hearing next week. Next week um, yes. It's actually a matter of national importance. Yes. Eight and the tenth, is that? Eight, nine and ten, Eight actually, ten, yes. yeah. So um, the challenge before the CCJ is the vote on the no confidence motion where the Court of Appeal held that 33 votes is not the majority of a 65 seat, seat member, member parliament. Member. Yes. Um, uh, however, the CCJ rules it have an impact on not only Guyana, but for other countries in the Caribbean as well, whichever manner they rule. It doesn't yes. only affect us because they're setting a yeah, precedent. There will be regional implications. Yeah, it's so definitely based on this precedent. So that, is, um, that was pointed out actually and stressed by Professor Errol Miller recently. So we have a clip from uh, Professor Errol Miller, which we'll now have a look at. Yeah, stay with us, stay with us. The Caribbean Court of Justice has been asked to rule on an appeal from Ghana, which has far reaching implications and impact for other governments and citizens of the Commonwealth Caribbean. It concerns the simple question, what amounts to a majority vote by our parliamentarians in our jurisdictions? The facts are as follows. On December 21, 2018, the National Assembly of Guyana, consisting of 65 members, voted 33 to 32 in favor of a no confidence motion. The speaker certified the vote. A case was then adjudicated in the Supreme Court of Ghana, in which the learned chief justice ruled that 33 constituted a majority vote for the motion. The alternative proposition before the Chief Justice was that it was 34 votes that constituted a majority. The mathematical foundation of that proposition was that the total number of 65 members of the Assembly should be divided by two, then rounded to the next whole number, after which one should be added to the result. That is, 65 divided by 2 equals 32.5, rounded to the next whole number, 33, and then add 1, 34. An appeal contesting the ruling of the Chief Justice was lodged in the Appeal Court of Ghana, where the case was heard by three judges of the Appeal Court. Two judges upheld the appeal, and one judge denied the appeal that is, agreed with the decision of the Chief Justice. An appeal has been lodged with the Caribbean Court of Justice for final decision. The decision of the CCJ will not only apply to Guyana, but to countries of the Commonwealth Caribbean that regard the CCJ as the final court of authority 
or hopes to do so. The implication for the democracy in the Commonwealth Caribbean will be profound. Up to 2001, the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago had 36 seats. In the general elections of December 2001, the vote was tied in terms of the number of seats, 1818. It took 10 months for the deadlock, hiatus, and paralysis in the parliament to be resolved by the general elections of October 2002. Realizing all the dangers that had been averted and counseled by the paralysis that had occurred in the parliament, the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago moved to increase the number of seats to an odd number, 41. The general elections in Trinidad and Tobago in November 2007 was contested on 41 seats in the parliament. Taking note of the experience of Trinidad and Tobago, the people and government of Jamaica acted and amended the Constitution of Jamaica to increase the number of constituencies into which Jamaica was divided from 60, an even number, to 65, with an immediate adjustment to 63. The general elections of September 2007 was contested on 63 seats. In the Jamaican general elections of February 2016, the Jamaica Labour Party won 32 seats, and the People's National Party, which had been the government, won 31 seats. The government changed hands. There was no contest, no protest, on the basis of the one-seat majority. In addition, all laws that was, have been passed in the House of Representatives on 32 to 31, that is a one-seat majority, a one-vote majority, has been accepted as valid and legal. On the basis of this experience, at least Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica should have more than a casual interest in the result of this case from Guyana as it is adjudicated by the Caribbean Court of Justice. The mathematical foundation of the proposition that 34 seats constitute a majority in the 65-seat National Assembly represents new electoral mathematics. It requires the presence of two unnamed phantom members in the National Assembly. 33 persons actually voted on December 21, 2018 in the Parliament. If 34 is a majority, then when you add 33 plus 34, you'll get 67 votes. But there are only 65 seats in the National Assembly. Applied to Trinidad and Tobago, the calculation would be 41 divided by 2 equal 20.5, rounded to the next whole number, 22 plus 1, 23 plus 22 equal 43 votes in the 41 member parliament. Applied to Jamaica, it would be 63 divided by 2 equal 31.5, rounded to the next whole number, 32 plus 1 equal 33 plus 32 equal 65 votes in the 63 member parliament. More votes cast than is constitutionally eligible constitutes electoral malpractice in all Caribbean con Commonwealth Caribbean countries and probably across the world. It is commonly referred to as overvoting. More votes cast than there are persons el eligible to cast them. One can only hope that the members of the learned profession representing both sides of this case before the CCG will ensure that all legal procedures and all technicalities are strictly observed in a timely manner and that the various points of view are argued to the, with the highest levels of logic, 
facts and eloquence such that the matter to be decided by the judges of the CCJ are with respect to law and merit. Perhaps the CCJ is the most fit in court to review what transpired in the Ghanese parliament and courts. The CCJ's present president, Justice Adrian Saunders, in a recent presentation at a human rights forum in Jamaica, described the CCJ's deliberation as seen from near, judging from far. Hopefully, this close-up knowledge and understanding of the Commonwealth Caribbean, coupled with its commitment to arm's length application of logic and law, will exemplify high principle, common sense, and the wisdom, the proven wisdom of electoral practices in the Commonwealth Caribbean and our democracies. Welcome back, viewers. Well, there you have it. At least Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago should have more than a casual interest in the Guyana case currently before the CCJ and the ruling of the court. This is the quote directly from Mr. Errol Miller. With us tonight to discuss this is to, dis to discuss this for his former Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs and PPPC Parliamentarian, Mr. Moabir Anil Nandalal. Welcome, Mr. Nandalal, to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Nandalal, could you uh, please, based on the quote that one has just read there, can you give us um, uh, your insights, your thoughts on the at least Jamaican trend that should have paid a more keen interest on this case before the CCJ? First of all, um, permit me to thank you for inviting me to be part of your discussion. It's the first time that I'm on this program. And uh, permit me to wish uh, every Guyanese uh, happy Labor Day. As you know, today is a public holiday in Guyana where we salute our workers for, the struggle, for their struggles and their advancements. And I, it's only fit and proper that I take this opportunity to salute all of our workers and wish each and every one of them a happy Labor Day. Now, um, the professor has rightfully highlighted that the situation which confronts Guyana in terms of the no confidence motion and the behavior of the government in not recognizing the constitutional consequences of the no confidence motion is not isolated or um, confined to Guyana. Yes. It has ramifications for democracies right across the British Commonwealth. Yes, indeed. The no confidence mechanism is part of the British Westminster constitutional structure and it exists in most countries, if not all, in the 50 Commonwealth states. That's so what, how, and since its existence uh, from 1948, where it first um, appeared in the Indian constitution and it first manifested itself in the Indian constitution, since then, the no confidence motion has always had the effect provided for and contemplated by the constitution. Yes. Even before it appeared in the written constitutions of the Commonwealth Territory, it has been part of the constitutional convention of the unwritten British constitution for over 250 years. That's right. And whenever the no confidence, a no confidence motion was successfully passed, the consequences have always been the same. One, the government of the day against whom the no confidence motion is passed must resign yes. and elections are to be held within a time prescribed by the constitution or within three months if there is no constitution, as there is no constitution in England. That's correct. Right? Yeah. So that has always been the consequences. Yeah. Uh, now, for the first time in the history of the British Commonwealth, you have a no-confidence motion being passed, and the government against which it is passed has refused obstinately 
to abide with the consequences prescribed by the Constitution that will follow when a no-confidence motion is successfully passed. That is, the government of the day refuses to resign and refuses to fix a date for elections. Okay, leave, leave now, enough on that. Now, just let me complete the point. Mm -hmm. Now, if that precedent is allowed to stand, mm -hmm. yes. then whenever a no-confidence motion is passed against any government in the Caribbean and in the Commonwealth, you have a precedent now whereby a government against whom you know, confidence motion is passed can say, well, we are not going to abide by it mm. because the Guyana government did so and they got away with it. Mm. They challenged it and more specifically, the gentleman made reference to Jamaica and to Trinidad because in particular Trinidad at one time, they had uh, equally numbered uh, yes. seats, seats in, in their in national the assembly. Yes, yeah. At one time, they had um, 18 and 18, mm -hmm. 36 seats. And the PNM government, PNM party had won 18, and UNC had won 18. Yeah. So there was a tie. And you had a whole set of confusion before new elections were held. And Jamaica, I think he made reference to Jamaica because, again, there is an odd number member of um, uh, number of seats in the National Assembly and both Jamaica and Trinidad have the no confidence motion mechanism as every other country yes. in the Caribbean. Trinidad subsequently in recognition of the problems that flow from having even numbers in their parliament, they changed it yes. and they reconfigured their constituency system and now they have an odd number. So a no-confidence motion in the ordinary course of things will pass flu fluidly yes. without, without any any, um, yeah. any humbug yes. and any um, fabricated arguments That's correct. as have been concocted in Guyana. Well, we know what has happened here in Guyana. So could you uh, explain to us the cases that are before the CCJ as it relates to the no-confidence motion? Who are the parties involved and some of the reliefs that you're seeking from the CCJ? Well, as you know, the... Chief Justice, let's start there. Yes. Yeah. Three cases were filed before, but in the High Court. Mm -hmm. One filed by Christopher Ram, one filed by um, the farmer, what's his name again? Compton, 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 Reed. Compton, Reed, Compton, Reed, Compton Reed, and one filed by the Attorney General. Yes. The one filed by the Attorney General challenged the computation of the vote and the validity of the vote cast. The Attorney General case simply put was that 33 votes did not constitute a majority, majority yeah. of the 65 National Assembly, 65 member National Assembly for the vote to be validly passed. Yes. Therefore, the no-confidence motion was not passed in accordance with the Constitution. Yes. Compton Reed, his challenge was a little wider. His argument essentially was that Charandas, who voted in favor of the opposition rather than the government, of which he is a member in the National Assembly, Charandas's vote was invalid for the following reasons. One, that Charandas is a dual citizen of both Guyana and Canada that the Constitution prohibits dual citizens from sitting, mm -hmm. from being elected yeah. to sit in the National yeah. Assembly and from obviously participating yes. in the proceedings, in the proceedings. of the <coughs> National Assembly yes. and therefore his vote wa would have been null and void. And thirdly, that by voting in favor of the opposition Charandas has effectively crossed the floor. And if one crosses the floor, then one has to comply with a procedure laid down in the Constitution. And that Charandas, by that vote, uh, crossed the floor and, they, and that vote become, became invalid. Yes. Christopher Rabb, on the other hand, filed an action in which he sought a declaration that a no-confidence motion was validly and properly passed in accordance with the Constitution. 
he sought an order that um, directed the president and the government to resign, yes. and he sought an order for elections to be fixed in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution, which is within three months from the date that the no-confidence motion was passed. The Chief Justice, of course, at the hearing in the High Court, the leader of the opposition was joined as a party upon yes, an application done, made yeah. by the leader of the opposition. He was joined as a party to the action filed by Reed. Yes. He was joined as a party to the action filed by the Attorney General. Yes. And he was named as a respondent by Christopher Rapp. Yes. The reason why we had to get involved in the action is because we feared that unless we had gotten involved, then the speaker, who was the respondent, could have possibly gone ahead and consented to judgment or don't contest the proceedings, Indeed, yeah. as the speaker actually ended up doing. Mm -hmm. The speaker, as you know, though a lawyer was retained and appeared for the speaker, the speaker took the position throughout the case that he is not defending it, mm -hmm. that he is just, he will be in the case and he will abide by any order that the court may make. So it's a good thing yes, that we joined a, a because decision. we, we a put a resistance there. Yeah. Of course, Charandas was named as a party, so Charandas lawyers also played a part. And then Joseph Harmon, in his capacity as chairman of APNU, mm -hmm. also made an application and was joined to the proceedings. So those were the parties that participated in the matter in the High Court. And as you know, the Chief Justice dismissed the Attorney General's case and she ruled in relation to that matter that 33 votes constituted a majority. So that throughout the, the Attorney General's challenge. Then in relation to Compton Reed, the Chief Justice ruled that though Charandas was or is a dual citizen and therefore and is in fact and in law prohibited from sitting in the parliament and being elected to sit in the parliament, the constitution itself, Article 165.2 of the constitution, saved the validity of the vote. Article 165.2 <coughs> says that no proceedings in the National Assembly can be invalidated because of the disqualification or non-qualification of a member who may have participated mm -hmm. in the proceedings. And the Chief Justice also found that there was no crossing the floor by Charandas, that a member of the National Assembly is free to vote lawfully, democratically, and constitutionally against a party that has placed him in the National Assembly. Yes. And consequently also, the Chief Justice upheld the declarations uh, sought by Christopher Ram. The Chief just well, she didn't fully uphold all of them. Mm -hmm. What she ruled essentially is that the no confidence motion was validly passed, that cabinet and the president was resigned or were resigned mm -hmm. by operation of the constitutional provision yeah. on the day that the no confidence <laughs> motion was passed, as provided for by the constitution, and that she directed that the constitutional provisions be followed, which meant naturally that elections were supposed to have been fixed. Yeah. Now, they appealed. Yeah. Charandas appealed, and um, yes, Charandas appealed, Compton Reed appealed, and the Attorney General appealed. Um, and they appealed on the very ground that they challenged Yes. In the High Court, all, all because the, they, all, they all lost. All the matters right. were, were brought back to the appeal. R court. That's correct. The Court of Appeal ruled upholding the Attorney General's case. The Court of Appeal, as you know, mm -hmm. two judges to one ruled that 33 votes did not constitute a majority, that 34 votes were required. The Court of Appeal, in so doing, read into the Constitution the requirement that a no-confidence motion needed an absolute majority for it to pass. The Constitution doesn't speak to that. 
There is no mention of the word absolute, it's not, it's not nowhere in the provision, nor in the entirety of the Constitution. In any event, assuming that the word absolute was there, it would have made no difference because absolute means, absolute majority simply means that all the members of the National Assembly must be present and voting. That's correct. And you have to get a majority of, of that. that, that are and That's right. what happened on that day, coincidentally, was that all the members of the National Assembly were present. Were present. They were there. They were there. And you have 65. A majority of 65 is 33. Whether you want to call it absolute, simple, simple or just majority. Or whatever majority. terminology you wish to you to yeah, describe it, that's it. it. That is a majority of 65. Any other permutation would lead to absurdity because you would need and not, you would need 34 votes to pass a whole set of things That's correct. when the government itself would have only had 33. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? All the that's budgets right. and right. everything. So, so that's how the, the, the two judges of the Court of Appeal ruled in relation to that matter. Mm -hmm. And in relation to the other matter filed by Reed, they, I, they essentially dismissed Reed's appeal because they said that, yes, Sharon Das was a dual citizen or is a dual citizen, but and while he was prohibited from being elected to sit in the parliament and may have been prohibited from participating in the parliament, the fact that he participated did not invalidate his vote because of the existence of Article 165.2 and because of a doctrine called the de facto doctrine. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of complications. Yeah. But that, in essence, is what um, they have ruled. Mm -hmm. So naturally we appeal yeah. and our appeal is a narrow appeal mm -hmm. because the only part of the case that we lost is in relation to 34. whether 33 or 34, 34 votes yeah. constitute a majority of 65. I have a question here but I, and, want, you, I, want, you to I want you to complete your point yeah. but I have a question. And whether <coughs> the, our constitution requires an absolute majority yeah. and if so what is a maj uh, absolute majority in a total of 65 members when all are present and voting? Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? Yeah. So that is the very, very narrow issue that we have appealed on. But of course, they have been cross appeals. That's mm -hmm. right, of course. They have been cross appeals by, um, by uh, Reed, as well as by Harmon, as well as by um, Christopher Ram. And, and the Attorney General. Significantly, the, the, the Caribbean Court of Justice, at the hearing of the preliminary hearing, for, for simplicity, that we have had through Skype at the Court of Appeal, mm -hmm. and a lot of Guyanese may have followed it because it yeah. was streamlined was really like, yeah. on, on the internet, they required GCOM to be made a party. We saw that. We saw and being added, GCOM yeah. was made a party, yeah. and we were ordered to serve GCOM a copy of our appeal and a copy of all the proceedings. Correct. We did so within the time prescribed, and as you know, a number of directions were given to the court in terms of when submissions are to be filed, yes. uh, time and line. give time frames Straight and so on, lines. when replies yeah. are to be done, etc. Yeah. Yeah. We have complied with all those time frames and we have put in all the submissions within the time prescribed. Then we had another hearing uh, by Skype at the Guyana Court of Appeal where we had to receive guidelines now in terms of presentation of arguments mm -hmm. and the dates fixed. Okay. Um, of course, you know and your viewers are aware that the dates that have been fixed are the 9th and the 10th of May, uh, beginning at 9 a.m. in the morning, and the respected lawyers who have been identified mm -hmm. to do their presentation on behalf of the different parties yeah. have been allocated uh, specific time slots mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, the, the time that they have to speak and the time when they will have to do their presentation. Mm -hmm. yes. So all those matters and mechanics have been worked out mm -hmm. and now we, are, we have to travel 
to 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 present the arguments on the yeah. 9th and and the 10th. No. So the primary issue is actually the 34 uh, issue, the 34 uh, votes uh, in Guyana's 65 uh, member National Assembly. Can you explain uh, in layman terms what Article uh, 1066 says, given that this is the primary challenge? All that Article 106 says, in terms of that, is that if a no confidence motion is passed by a majority of all elected members of the National Assembly, then the government is defeated. Okay. In a sense, that's what it means, mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, number of votes. You will see that there is nowhere is it mentioned the word absolute. Now there is a fundamental and cardinal rule of interpretation of both the Constitution and any other statutory law. And it is this, when the language of the provision is clear, when the language of the provision is clear, you must give that the language expressed their literal, grammatical, ordinary, plain meaning. Mm. Okay. If you read Article 1066, there is not a single word in that article that is capable of any ambiguity, any equivocation whatsoever, none. Mm. So the first rule that one must apply is that you must give the words their ordinary, plain, grammatical meaning. Which, which is the second theory. important rule is that one must not import words into a section that are not in the section. The presumption is that if the framers wanted to use whatever word they wished to have present in that provision, they would have put it there themselves. Yeah. The fact that they did not put the word absolute there, one must conclude that that is deliberate. The framers of the Constitution are not uneducated people. Absolute mm -hmm. majority is a term of art. It's not something that, is, that lawyers are unfamiliar with. And therefore, any lawyer who would have been engaged in the drafting of that provision, if they wanted to put absolute majority, they would have put absolute majority. They put majority. Yeah. Majority standing by itself connotes simple majority. That's correct. Right? So the appeal is a very, very simple appeal. It should not take long, but lawyers have, Rudy have seen, he has seen mm -hmm. the volumes of documents. <laughs> they are this high. Yes. We have to take about three suitcases wow. of documents. The arguments, the, the proceedings themselves, the authorities that they are going to rely on. This is a 10 minutes case. Basically. I think <laughs> the court has decided it already. Because what is complicated? The court has to pick up its three lines in the Guyana Constitution. Three lines. Whether, and if the one, one must look at the language, and also one must look at the practice to decipher and determine the intent of the framers of the document. Yeah. Anytime you are required to read and interpret a document, the objective is what did the writer mean yes. when he coined that document or crafted that document. Okay. All we have to do is to look at our parliamentary practice. From independence, 33 votes have always constituted a majority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The government was able to form itself as a government because 33 constituted a valid majority over 32 because we have 32 seats and they have 33. Mm -hmm. Just backpedal a little to the 10th parliament of Guyana when they had 33 as opposition. Mm -hmm. And you would see how they were able to vote down the anti-money laundering bills, the Customs Act that caused us to lose the case to, to the Suriname yes, Beverage yes, Company. Yes, yes, yes. They, they, you, you know how many budgets they cut. They, they voted down the, the Amaila Falls project and our ability to, our, uh, and it caused us, they made us unable to raise the requisite capital because we had to get a vote from the National Assembly to increase our ability, our debt ratio. All of that they were able to do because they had 33 votes and we had 32. <coughs> but this, and they this, were this planning to win the yes, no confidence yes. motion. Mm -hmm. 
They were planning to win the no confidence motion. Of course, at the time they didn't know that Charandas would have voted that the way the way that they did. That, did, yeah. that is why, if you go back to the record, you will see clips of Amna Ali saying, "Bring it on!" <laughs> you heard Ramjatan said, "We will win." At the yes. time when the vote yep. comes, Nagamutu was on television weeks and days before saying, "How can 33 beat 32?" Mm -hmm. Because at the time they were speaking about their 33, not knowing that Charandas would have strayed from the flock. I say all of that to you to say that the case before the CCG is a very, very simple one. And I have no doubt, personally speaking, I don't have any information. I don't, and this is purely my feeling, my gut feeling. The case is already decided. Those are big people, they are educated people, and I don't believe that they will compromise their integrity, they will compromise their independence, and they will stain the court as a final court by coming to a decision <coughs> that is perverse, that is, um, um, that is, um, what is the word I'm using for? Absurd. Mm -hmm. Absurd. Any other decision other than upholding the validity of the new confidence motion would be, in my respectful view, an absurd decision. Yeah, I just wanted to make one more point though. Uh, th this whole issue about 34 was brought to you while you were uh, while you were yes. attorney general back then. So just comment a bit on that and why didn't you take up the uh, just when brief briefly uh, when uh, Moses Nagamutu moved or filed with the clerk of the National Assembly in 2014, <coughs> I believe uh, October 2014. He filed a no confidence motion signed by him or moved by him and seconded by Cassie Hughes. Of course, I was the Attorney General and a, a certain lawyer called me and said, look, you can get around this thing. So I said, how? And he told me about the same argument and he brought the same cases, the same two or three cases at the time. That's right. That's and right. I read it. And it did not make sense. Mm -hmm. So you had, the, op you had the opportunity, sense. but you didn't, you didn't take it on back No, then. I advised President Rabotar at the time and the cabinet. I said, we have, we have two options. Yeah. One, you can go to the, we can go to the parliament and suffer the humiliation of a defeat by the new confidence motion. And trust me, we couldn't go and argue anywhere that 30, 30 33 30. votes were required. We couldn't go. Georgetown would have burnt. Georgetown would have been burnt. People would have been beaten and robbed and there would have been physical chaos in this country. So we couldn't even begin to conceive that that is an argument that you can even put forward. That's the first thing. Um, but it did not make any intellectual sense, more, most importantly. And the second option I told the cabinet and President Ramotar at the time, is that you can prorogue the parliament. Which was the course was used. And which was the course and that we used. And that provision. was authorized mm -hmm. by the constitution. constitution. We got a lot of provision. criticisms That's right. for so doing so. And, and yeah, that on law, all sorts of craziness. Yeah. And look at what they have done. They have yes. trampled upon the express provisions of the constitution, which required them to resign. Mm -hmm. They never resigned up to now. Mm -hmm. But prorogation, was an authorized procedure under the Constitution. Yes. So yes. we opted for that latter yeah. course. Uh, speaking about them trampling on the Constitution, mm -hmm. I'd like to take you now to the GCOM chairman case. Yeah. We know that President Granger has violated 25 years of common understanding between the government and opposition. And he unilaterally appointed uh, retired Justice Patterson to the chair. Um, you have that case before the CCJ also, so can you briefly yes. explain what's happening with that case? You would recall that the Court of Appeal ruled against us in that matter, and we filed an appeal to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Coincidentally, that matter is now fixed at the Caribbean Court of Justice to be heard on the 8th of May. So we have three, three days of three, hearings. Three days. Um, the, the GCOM case on the 8th and the, two no confidence, the three no confidence motions appeals on the 9th and 10th. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of the GCOM case, um, the appeal is fixed for hearing and what is important in all the cases, 
I, I, I have very, I have very little doubt that we are going to win the cases. Now, winning a victory can be academic only if it doesn't give you what really is important. These appeals were not filed for academic and honorific purposes. They were filed to achieve particular objectives. For example, the whole purpose of the new confidence motion, the whole purpose why it was passed, was to get us to elections early. If we win the appeals and the court does not make orders that will guarantee us early elections, then our victory will be a fyric one, would be a perfunctory one. The one the what we the need, not only merely to win the cases, but we need orders, consequential orders, that will direct the holding of elections within the shortest possible time to give effect to the letter and spirit of the Constitution, which commands that a government that has been defeated by a no-confidence motion must resign and go to elections within three months. Now, we can't get that three months. That three months have already elapsed. It is gone. The, all that the court can do now is to give effect to the spirit of the Constitution, which is expedient, speedy elections. Right? So while the three months have gone, you still they can still achieve the spirit of the constitutional objective, which is early elections. Mm -hmm. Certainly not at the end of the five-year tenure, because if that is the ultimate result, then the no-confidence motion would have been rendered ineffective, and the constitution itself would have been defeated. That's correct. And subverted by well forces well put. intended yeah. to subvert yeah. it. Yeah. The same thing with the GCOM yeah. chairman. Yeah. If we get Mr. Justice Patterson removed, but we don't get orders that direct the appointment of a new chairman with dispatch within time frame prescribed and as quickly as possible, then we are back to square one. Yeah. You might as well leave Patterson. Right? So it is of absolute importance that we emphasize to the court in each of these cases the fundamental import of the consequential orders that they are, well, we will persuade them that they are mandated to make to give effect to the, the spirit at least of the Constitution. Because at the end of the day, it is the judiciary as the arm of government that is resided with the exclusive responsibility of guardianship of the Constitution. What that means is that whenever the Constitution comes under threat, is violated, is contravened, is mutilated, is trampled upon, then the judiciary has all the plenitentiary powers to ensure that orders are made, are made and directions are given to bring the Constitution back into conformity as far as possible. That's right. And that is the ultimate function of the judiciary. If we don't achieve that, <coughs> then the judiciary would not, in my respectful view, discharge the conceptual, conceptual and constitutional role as provided for by the Constitution itself. Well, we can get a definite answer if they will do that, but uh, does the chances look good, I would say, or does, does it look like if that is the route that you will take uh, on, on this? I, I have to assume, as a lawyer yes. and as an officer of the court, that the court is very well familiar with its duties, responsibilities, and charge, that it is intimately familiar with the orders that it can make. It has a deep and abiding knowledge of its powers, 
its role in the matrix of a constitutional governance comprising of the judiciary, the parliament, and the, the, the executive, and has a conceptual understanding that if the executive runs off course, as has happened now, because let us say, let me complete the point, runs off course, yeah. that, that it is only the judiciary that can bring it back onto its constitutional track. Okay. There's no other institution okay. that can do that. Okay. Right? Because if, let us say, the court rules, well, then, you know, convenience motion was validly passed, so appeal allowed, and that is it, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? The government then catapults into illegality, the country goes into, careens into chaos, and there is no precedent now because the three months have expired, because you're reverting now to status quo ante, yeah. the Court of Appeal ruling. Yeah. So the March 21st period resuscitates itself. Excellent. And there is a whole nation of illegality now arising. I understand that. So okay. there is no president really. There is a person holding the office okay. of president, but he's doing so extra constitutionally. He can't strictly speaking, discharge powers under the Constitution because he himself and his office would be orbiting outside mm -hmm. of the precincts of the Constitution, the four corners of the Constitution. Yes. So those issues have to be made very, very clear to the court. Yes. And the court must understand, must be made to understand that this is not a normal case here. From the time the court rules that the no-confidence motion was validly passed, then the entire Guyana's executive careens into a state of illegality. So right there, directions have to be given to on be how you put Guyana back yeah. on a constitutional track. And I think it's important. All right? It's important so those issues have to be internalized, understood, and put over back to the court. Okay so that there is a clear understanding by the court of the humongous responsibility that the court bears in relation to the nation state of Guyana okay. and could give appropriate directions yep. to bring us back to normalcy. So another court case uh, that is, that is uh, before the, the Guyana courts has to do with GCOM also. Um, uh, can you provide an update on this? Uh, this, is, this has to do with the, the registration or deregistration exercises yes. uh, and the new host-to-host -host registration exercise that is, uh, that is being peddled by this government. Or? Well, as you know, GCOM insists that they must go to house-to-house -house registration because according to GCOM, the list is bloated. Mm -hmm. I have pointed out over and over again that while I do not dispute that the list may be bloated, resorting to house-to-house -house registration in the manner thought out and expressed by GCOM would be to engage in an unconstitutional act. Why? Yes, why? First of all, if the list is bloated and GCOM has said quite clearly that yes. there are two categories of occupants on the list that needs trimming down. <coughs> One, dead people. Mm -hmm. And I have over and over pointed <coughs> out that a very simple engagement between the Registrar of Deaths and GCOM, the Chief Elections Officer, who is the National Registration Officer, and a, 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 an engagement between the two entities can denude the list of all the dead people who are recorded as dead at the GRO office, right? Mm. So I'm not saying that all deaths are going to be recorded there, yeah. but 99% of the deaths are going to be recorded there. Okay. So you take a great weight off the list. Mm -hmm. The second set of occupants are the, those who may have migrated. Unfortunately, the present state of the law 
does not permit those persons to be taken off the list because domicile and residence are not requirements to vote in Guyana. Okay. These people have already been registered. The right to vote is a constitutional one. Yes. Once they have been registered, they are qualified to vote. No one can disqualify them without an, any fault of theirs. Everybody has a freedom, a constitutional freedom to travel out of this country. That's a constitutional right. Yes. So if I decide to travel out of this country and I decide to spend 10 years out of this country, that is my constitutional right and freedom. You can't start an exercise behind my back. Take my name off the list when my presence is not required. Right? And then disqualify me from voting by that exercise. Okay. In addition to that, our laws, which is the antithesis to house-to-house -house registration, our laws mandate a cyclical type of registration. Okay. What that means is that all year round there is a cycle going wrong of registration. Those of us who are in the political arena, we know that every six months or every four months, every quarter, a new cycle starts. And it goes all year round. It never stops. The base year, and we put that in our law, yeah. the base year we started with was year 2000. Mm -hmm. So whatever was the voters, the national registration list in 2000, as the cycle goes, we keep adding to it as people come of age. And yes. we're supposed to be removing from it through the claims and objection period when people die and through engagements with the GRO as well. Yes. The point I am making is that this cycle can't stop. It cannot stop. Mm. When you are going to do house-to-house -to -house registration in the manner contemplated and explained by GCOM, what they are doing is that they are stopping the cycle throwing away all the data that they have in the system and they're going to start a new process wow. starting from Crabwood Creek. Wow. Right? So everyone who are on the list now, their names are going to be scrapped and a new list is going to be created. Entirely, an entirely new list. Absolutely new list. list. That's what they're doing. An entirely new list. First of all, that will take four years. Minimum four years. I don't care what they say. Four years. Four years minimum. <laughs> You have to get every single Guyanese. And that runs contrary to the, our statutes and our legal provisions, which speaks to a continuous cycle, cycle. of registration. Yes. That is why when GCOM is saying that they cannot be ready for an election, it's absolute nonsense. We change the laws of this country to make GCOM in a perpetual state of readiness by the imposition of a cyclical form of registration. That was the whole purpose of it, That's so that GCOM can always be ready for election because we did not want the 91 situation, 1991 situation, where we had a horrible list and we had to extend the, part, the life of the government for two long years. When we conceive and design the Carter formula, etc., part of the reforms was yeah. the list and reforming the whole cycle of the list and so on. Coming out of that experience, in the 2000s, we decided that we will have a different form of registration, which is cyclical as opposed to stopping and start over. Yes, my, my detractors are going to argue that as of 2008, the PVP did that. They started a new house-to-house -house registration. Well, I am saying now that that was not right. It was not right. Okay. And sometimes we have to do the right thing. Okay. And having learned, we must not repeat the same mistake. Because we have a court ruling also that guides us. The case of Esther Pereira says exactly what I am saying. Okay. In that matter, both the PNC and the PVP went to Parliament and they jointly agreed, unanimously, 
to add a new requirement to be eligible to vote, which is that you must be possessed of a voter's ID card. Now, the Constitution says... 97? I'm, I'm not sure. 97, yes. This was 97. Yes, 97. Okay, okay. Now, the Constitution says that you must... All, you have to be 18 and you have to be registered. That's all the two requirements that yeah. the Constitution, our Supreme Law, yes. says. They pass an ordinary law and they said they've had a third requirement. Well, if you add a third requirement, you are, you are now conflicting with the Supreme Law. And the Constitution says that any law that conflicts with the Supreme Law is unconstitutional, unlawful, illegal. Yes, I, I, so the requirement of the voter's ID card, Claudette Singh, the judge, knock it down on the ground that it was illegal. They added a new requirement, a new qualification to be eligible to vote without amending the Constitution, which lists only two requirements. And anything that runs contrary to the Constitution is illegal. It's as simple as that. Now they are going to do the same thing. If one Edgil is in Suriname mm -hmm. and is, is not at Kiskadi Drive, South Rumveld, on the morning that the evaluator comes there to take your name, yes. then you are not going to be registered. In effect, they are depriving you of your right to vote. Though, you, if you'll check the Constitution, one, you are 18 years, and two, you are registered. I'm registered also, yes. What wrong did you do causing you to be deregistered? What did you do? So you are losing your right to vote by an act that you had nothing to do with. That is absolutely unconstitutional. Uh, what you've just said, Mr. Nandlal, um, the AFC has been arguing that youths will not be on the list, but as you've just explained, youths, the system. Steve, system. every time a child becomes age 14 years and over, mm -hmm. they are caught in the registration cycle. Mm -hmm. When they reach the age to go on the voters list, the cycle graduates them over to the voters list. The AFC, if they are saying that, then they have no understanding of how the cyclical registration system works. And I'm not surprised mm -hmm. that they have no understanding of how it works. Okay, Mr. Nandlal, um, I have just one more question for you before you give your closing remarks. We also know that you um, just yesterday filed a case against um, the director and deputy director of SARA. Um, can you give us an update um, as to that case? Well. <clears throat> SARA, as you know, is SARA is an acronym or an abbreviation for State Asset Recovery Agency. Mm -hmm. That agency is created by an act called SARA Act. Yes. Mm -hmm. The State Asset Recovery Agency Act. That act has become law because it was passed in the parliament and assented to by the president since um, 2017. Mm -hmm. That act tells you, and that's the law, eh? when I say act for the yes. purpose of the viewers, it's the law. It's the, law. Mm -hmm. the law tells you now how a, the director, the law tells you first of all that the two principal officers of this agency is called a director and the deputy is called a deputy director. The law tells you that the director is to be appointed by a simple majority of the National Assembly upon a recommendation of the appointment committee. That's it the says, parliamentary committee. Yes, a parliamentary committee. It says the same thing for the deputy director. Dr. Professor Clive Thomas and Hetty Meyer, I always forget his first name, I can't remember, mm -hmm. have been act, not acting, they have been performing substantively the, 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 the functions of director and deputy director of this agency from the time it was formed. Mm -hmm. Now, the act also says that its precursor, that the agency that existed before it, was called SARU. The act also said that all the staff who are staff of SARU will transition over 
and become the staff of Sarah, but that transition period will be for four months only. So, Professor Clive Thomas and Mr. Hetty Meyer came over from Saru to Sarah, but the life of their, uh, their stint coming through that transitional provision was only for four months, mm -hmm. right? This act was passed since May the 4th, 2017. Three years, or 17, two years, and four months have already expired. Mm -hmm. And they never received their appointment through the National Assembly, as is mandated by the Act. Therefore, mm -hmm. they are clearly holding the two offices illegally and contrary to the provisions of the Act. They have been drawing monies illegally from the consolidated fund and salaries, remuneration and other benefits. They have been exercising legal powers illegally. They have charged, they have instituted civil proceedings against a host of people, including Bharat Jagdev, Clement Rohi, a whole host of people. Political opponents. All they have done, all of this is done illegally. So I decided to pull the tree from the root because I've written more than 10 articles over the past two or three years highlighting this, and of course, it falls on deaf ears. So the court will have to decide. And I have asked the court for an order, essentially throwing them out of office. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nandlal, for your time and for all those brilliant explanations. Um, if there's anything you'd like to say briefly before we wrap up tonight's program in closing. I want to thank you very much once again for inviting me and um, I want to congratulate the two of you and your, your um, what's the portfolio? Producer. <laughs> and producer, <laughs> Ms. Vanessa Narain for coordinating, planning and organizing a very, very good program, very informative program and I'm sure that your audience are enjoying and are learning tremendously from the volume of information that you are disseminating here every week and I encourage you to continue to do so and to continue to strive to raise the standard of the program even higher though I believe that you have commandeered great heights already. Thank you very much and um, once again good evening to your yeah. listeners. Thank you very much for those kind words Mr. Nandlal. Okay, well, basically we, we would like to thank uh, Mr. Nandalal for being on the program this evening. I'm sure he was very insightful with all the information and facts that he would have given us. Uh, you can uh, live stream those cases next week. He will be in, uh, in, in Trinidad along with, with several other attorneys. Uh, so you can pay attention to what is happening. Remember, this issue does involve all of us here in Ghana. It has to do with our rights. It has to do with our freedoms. and has to do with our constitution, most of all is our right. We have a right in this country to vote. We have a right to, to vote in elections. And, and that is the, the emphasis of what we want to place on this evening. Uh, we open the program by, by wishing all of our viewers a happy Labor Day. And we just want to allow the viewers to really reflect over the past four years and to ask yourself several questions about your present condition, your standard of living your access to certain services, welfare services, you know, are you really receiving more disposable income? Uh, you know, uh, is your standard of living rising or is it decreasing? So these are just a few points that you should, uh, you should, you should raise with yourself or quietly. Uh, just a quick That's reminder, already, yes. um, the topic that we're dealing with is facts and fiction yes. and the APNU, AFC government. government. Um, we thank you once again for tuning in with us and we hope to see you guys next week. Until next time, take care, goodbye.